So, good morning. Let us start the fifth day of this pass. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Matthew Taylor. That will uh, do the will have the floor or in the table or I don't know today for his uh, conference. So let me make a brief uh, presentation of Mr. Taylor. So I guess we all know the the famous story about the two economist covers this magazine, the, the one in November 2009, in which Brazil took off, started to fly, and the second one in 2013, in which Brazil clashed. So for us, the story is a little bit different. There was a point in time in which USP could uh, have Matthew Taylor as his professor. So that was the time in which we took off. So someone as Matthew with a PhD from Georgetown uh, writing a path-breaking book would consider to stay in Brazil and to make his career in Brazil. So Matthew stayed with us from 2006 to 2011. 2011. So that was the time we were flying, that we are on the air. So then Brazil and Matthew decided it was better to leave. <laughs> so that, that's the sad story about Brazil. But we can count with Matthew all the time. That's our privilege. Matthew was responsible while we say in Brazil to put uh, together or to construct our summer school, that is our showcase uh, at the political science department here in Sao Paulo. So Matthew was responsible for uh, constructing that. So it was uh, a, a very good period in which, the period in which Matthew was with us and he was able to contribute a lot for our department for the political science in Brazil. And he uh, is author of uh, several books. One of them uh, is this one, uh, Judging Policy, one in which he uh, contributed to the uh, literature showing that the judiciary could make policy, get into politics in countries like Brazil, and so this book opened up um, a, a, a agenda, a research agenda, that he is one of the leader, leaders uh, um, around the world. And so he has been doing a lot of research, publishing in uh, the most prestigious journals around uh, the world, in the political science world. He's author of books about corruption, something that he will talk to us today. So it's a great, great pleasure to have you back and to um, um, listen to your conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, I don't even know how to respond, uh, <laughs> except to say thank you. And uh, you won't get rid of me very easily. I keep coming back. So uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you to Maria Erminia and to Sebrape for, for having me, and uh, especially because it's wonderful to be able to see all these old colleagues and new uh, friends here. And maybe you can't see me by the end of this. It'll be dark. But uh, what I want to talk about is corruption. And I know that talking about corruption at this point in Brazil is quite difficult um, and polarizing and sometimes conflictual. And so I'm talking this morning about corruption in comparative perspective. And I think you'll see some of the parallels that I think may hold for Brazil. And I hope that in the conversation this afternoon, we can come back to it um, with a specific focus on Brazil. But for now, I'm going to ignore Brazil, uh, although I'm happy to take questions about Brazil directly. So, 
the theme that I was asked to talk about is corruption and democracy. And I think that there is some fairly consensual uh, understanding of how corruption and democracy go together. The first thing I'll say is about economic growth and, uh, and corruption. And what the data shows is that there's a very strong correlation here. The richer a country is, the less corrupt it is. And uh, you can see here the R squared on that regression line is uh, almost 58%. So there's a very strong relationship here. What we don't really know, though, is what's causing what? What's, uh, what's driving what? Is it that being less corrupt helps you to grow? Uh, or is it that being wealthy makes it easier to fight corruption? The second well-known fact is that democracy and control of corruption tend to go together. And so here what I've done is graphed the uh, Freedom House Index in which a seven over on the left is the worst score you can get, and a one over on the right is the best score you can get against uh, the World Bank, uh, World Governance Indicator Control of Corruption. And you can see here that again, there's a fairly strong relationship uh, you may be wondering what that outlier is at the very top in the middle at four, Singapore. Singapore, uh, uh, not a democracy, but a country that has managed uh, to control corruption quite well. And I don't think you can really see very clearly, but if you go to the, the third line from right to left, I've made a red dot for Brazil. So. Hard to see, but Brazil does fairly well on democracy. It does a little worse than the curve uh, in terms of control of corruption. Ah. Is that the longer you have a democracy, the better you do, generally speaking. And this is, of course, the least uh, clear cut of the, of the of the correlations that I've shown you so far, but this is years of continuous democracy. This is from the Boish Miller Rosato uh, data set. And uh, you can see that one of the reasons this curve doesn't work out quite so well is because of a particular democracy there that's old, and not just in the time of Trump, but not very good at controlling corruption relative to other old democracies, the United States. So, you know, this is sort of the conventional wisdom, and um, I think central to all of the understanding of corruption and democracy, when we think about these things together, is that it's very hard to untangle the relationship. Corruption is both a cause of dysfunction as well as a symptom of dysfunction. These things tend to go together. And Warren, in this very path-breaking article in 2004, noted several reasons for why this might be the case. Uh, one is that corruption breaks power, the people's power to influence collective decisions. Uh, it reduces the effective domain of public action by making some spheres of action private. It creates inefficiencies in the delivery of public services, which undermines their quality. And I think most importantly, corruption undermines democratic culture. It uh, undermines democratic culture by making the protections that citizens should have into favors, favors that need to be paid for or repaid in kind. It also undermines democratic culture by making people cynical about public speech, about public deliberation, it generally forces people to lose confidence that public decisions are taken for reasons that are publicly available. And then most importantly, corruption in a democracy is pernicious because when people are mistrustful of government, they're also cynical about their own ability to act on public goods. And so they prefer to attend to their narrow self-interest rather than engage in broadening the horizons of collective action. And therefore, 
this undermining of trust, this undermining of reciprocity, tends to undermine uh, collective mobilization to achieve everything that democracy, democracies can achieve. So summarizing a little bit here, the bad news about corruption is that good things go together. Good things go together. Economic development, political development, social development, and corruption improvements tend to go together. And when you don't have one, it can be hard to break out of this uh, low equilibrium. Okay, now on to the second part. So this was depressing. This was bad news. Now I'm going on to worse news. <laughs> the worst news, summarizing here, is that structure changes glacially. Most countries that today have reasonably effective anti-corruption systems stumbled into them. They stumbled into them by happenstance through incremental changes in governance rather than through systematic reforms targeted at anti-corruption. Even those that did achieve these gains did so very, very slowly. And as I'm about to show you, the success stories usually take around a half a century. Furthermore, there's no guarantee that the forward movement is self-sustaining. And with that in mind, I'm going to give you some concepts that I think will help us to think about how to talk about achieving lasting anti-corruption gains. But before I do that, let me just say, stick with me. I've given you bad news, I've given you worse news, and um, yet I think that realism, and we should be realistic, doesn't necessarily imply nihilism. We shouldn't throw up our hands and say we can't do anything about corruption. And as I'll show you with some case studies, uh, it may not be possible to move quickly from one equilibrium to another equilibrium, but it is possible, and it's possible to do so in relatively short time. So just to get us to there, let me give you two concepts that will frame my talk. The first is the concept of a policy burst. A policy burst is an adoption of multiple policy interventions. And the central idea here is governments do this all the time, right? We want to change social equity. How do we do it? We implement conditional cash transfers. We increase the minimum wage. Uh, so forth and so on. So th that would be a policy burst, a set of policy interventions. But in my conceptualization of this, policy bursts are simply the implementation of policy, and as we know, policies can peter out. They can lose traction if they're left untended. And so in the case of anti-corruption, you can think of multiple examples of where this has happened. Uh, passage of a, of a Freedom of Information Act, for example, where you get a short-lived burst of transparency. Suddenly, the media is able to use the Freedom of Information Act to get information that they couldn't otherwise find. But then, at some point, bureaucrats learn how to game the system. They learn how to reject requests. They learn how to send the least possible information. They learn how to put it in formats that are very hard to access they learn how to run out the clock. A second example, new prosecutorial tools, like anti-money laundering laws. And these can be very effective in the short term. They spawn new cases, they create new litigation, they enable prosecutors to move forward in ways that they weren't able to do so. But then there's a moment of adjustment. Criminal defense lawyers begin to adapt to the new laws, these prosecutions may hit new roadblocks if uh, the judiciary isn't working the way it was designed to, and so forth. Adoption of anti-corruption agencies. One of the most depressing things about anti-corruption efforts worldwide is that one of the key prescriptions that's been lauded is to create anti-corruption agencies, centralized agencies that will uh, sort of coordinate and lead anti-corruption efforts. And over 150 countries have anti-corruption agencies today. Of these, probably no more than a handful are actually functional. 
And so you get this policy burst, but then low political investment, um, weak political will, and oftentimes internal corruption. All right, so that's the first concept. The second concept is the notion of an equilibrium shift. And our goal here in, in the discussion today is to think about how we actually get an equilibrium shift. An equilibrium is simply a self-sustaining societal set of state of mind. And an equilibrium shift is therefore a change in a state of mind from one state of mind about how the world works to a new state of mind about how the world works. And so just to sort of, whoops, sorry. Um, just to, I've got two examples here of the extremes in terms of equilibriums. The most negative equilibrium, we can think about a country like Afghanistan, for example, where institutions are subverted, status and connections determine how public goods are provided, and a general lack of trust is what guides behavior. And that leads to all sorts of behaviors that, uh, from a corruption perspective, are very troubling, but they're totally rational within this equilibrium. A more positive equilibrium is often called Denmark. And the literature, believe it or not, often refers to Denmark. It's the, it's the positive equilibrium. And this is a, an equilibrium marked by ethical universalism, a virtuous cycle in which there's citizen participation, which then contributes to how institutions function, which then leads to uh, citizen empowerment. And you get this wonderful cycle um, that uh, can be very positive. Doesn't mean that it's always perfect, but it is more positive. Generally speaking, I think our goal in thinking about how to structure anti-corruption programs is to move from an equilibrium in which it's irrational to be honest to one in which accountability feeds on itself in the, in the Danish model. So changing norms, changing routines, changing institutional patterns of behavior. Before moving along, I'm not suggesting that we need to move all countries from Afghanistan to Denmark. It would be very difficult to do so. But you can make incremental equilibrium shifts along the way. And um, I think that should be our objective. And these shifts, as you'll see in a moment, can lead to very uh, positive improvements in the way citizens are treated in the way public policies are determined, in the way policy is implemented, even if they don't take countries all the way to Denmark, but only part of the way there. All right. So, in, in many ways, um, the paper on which this talk is based was inspired by reading uh, North Wallace and Weingast, and as most of you probably know, uh, North, the Nobel-winning economist, uh, in this book with his co-authors, makes an argument about how systems change from being what they call closed access political systems, marked by particularism and distrust, to what they call open access systems with inclusive political institutions, universalism, and formalized as well as informal trust. The bad news here is that this is a very rare occurrence. And so they themselves point to the fact that over the past two centuries, only 25 countries have actually made this leap. So many countries have gone from very closed access to somewhat less closed access. But very few countries have gone from very closed to open access. And as they point out, closed access systems are the historical norm. And once again here, in those countries that make the shift, it often takes decades. So let me try to talk a little bit about the countries that have managed to do it. And I'm not going to talk about all the cases, but um, what I'm trying to point out here is the way in which 
when things go well, policy shifts, or excuse me, policy bursts collectively add up to an equilibrium shift. So the first example here is the example of Sweden. And uh, I'm drawing heavily here on the work of Boo Rothstein. And Rothstein talks about the way in which Sweden from 1840 through the 1870s undertook a number of incremental uh, shifts in, in the policy arena. Uh, this, the direct impetus for this was a series of crushing military defeats, which pointed out the very corrupt, patronage-oriented nature of government in Sweden. And so this several decade long set of policy initiatives attempted to establish good governance by strengthening the civil service, removing patronage appointments, enhancing oversight for political leaders, including the monarchy, and ensuring genuine political contestation. And remember, at the time, the notion of genuine political contestation was relatively nascent. And so, as you'll note here, all of these policy initiatives were indirect reforms. None of them directly was focused on corruption. But all of the changes were driven by elite concerns about take, undertaking genuine institutional change. And over the course of this four-decade period, you have incremental reforms adding up into a significant shift in the corruption equilibrium. So it was a period marked by a lengthy transition period, little direct policy focus on corruption per se, and broad reforms across a wide range of institutions that altered the calculus in favor of collective action. Another example comes from the United States. And the case of the United States is often referred to in the literature. And we're talking about a very specific period in US history, frequently known as the Progressive Era. Now, the Progressive Era, I think one of the problems with the literature is that the Progressive Era is really only a 15-year period in the 1910s to, to 1920s. And the actual effort that led to the change in behavior in the United States was much longer, more like 60 years. Again here, though, this was a series of uncoordinated, unplanned series of accountability efforts. Let me be very quick to say that oftentimes the initiative here, the reason for undertaking these reforms was ugly. It was racist, it was anti-immigrant, it was nativist, but these public pressures uh, led to an accumulation of unrelated incremental institutional reforms, including the regulation of the trusts, these oligopolistic industries in the United States. Again, elimination of patronage hiring in the civil service, restrictions on corporate contributions and, and generally speaking, regulation of campaign finance, and an end to boss-driven politics. So this was a, a long period. Uh, Hofstadter, in a very famous uh, classic work on the changes in America in this era, dates it from William, William Jennings Bryan all the way through to the beginning of the New Deal. And this is because many of the ideas that William Jennings Bryan brought to the political system weren't actually implemented or put into effect until several decades later, like breaking up the trusts. So Glazer and Golden have a, a very nice book in which they, one of the chapters chronicles what happened in the United States. And they use media reports in the, in the in more or less a century and a half of media reports to chronicle the rise, kind of an arc-like rise and fall of corruption 
So a rise from 1815 to about 1850, then leveling out, beginning to fall in 1870, and reaching a new lower equilibrium by 1930s. And then you get stability from about the 1930s to the 1970s. And unfortunately, they don't continue the analysis because they have to stop somewhere. So we don't really know what has happened in the United States. But they do point to the movement from a very low level equilibrium to a much higher equilibrium. Anyway, I think that the US case is important because while we often think about countries that are in a high equilibrium as having always been there, as I mentioned, this didn't have an immaculate conception. It was not a neat and innocent construction. There was a great deal of ambiguous morality. There was considerable kind of haphazardness to the way in which policies were being developed. Some of the opposition was really opposition to mass politics. And one of the reasons that it worked was because during the progressive era, the pie was expanding. So the economy was growing, and it was possible for reformers to both continue patronage and introduce patronage reform. And so they could do this in the same context. All right. So these are, generally speaking, positive stories. I do not in any way mean to suggest that Sweden or the United States are icons to be looked up to, but rather that they have made an important equilibrium shift over these two different periods that I think can tell us a lot about other countries that are currently undertaking policy bursts. So let me give you two examples that are quite well known. And these are examples in which there was a policy burst, but then no equilibrium shift. And I want us to think about why that might be the case. Why was there no equilibrium shift, even though there was kind of hyperactivity in trying to change the corruption equilibrium? So the Italian case, I know, has gotten a lot of press in Brazil, in part because a particular judge here has written about it um, and drawn attention to it. And there were a number of factors at work during the Mani Puliti investigations in, in Italy that began in 1992 that enabled these investigations to actually work better than they had in the past. And as you know, the story is a very hopeful one at the outset. There were uh, more than 6,000 individuals who were investigated, more than 500 members of parliament, and five former prime ministers. So this was a huge, huge anti-corruption effort. And it came about because of greater independence of a new generation of investigating magistrates. It came about in part because of the success and the popularity of anti-mafia efforts. It came about partly because of an end of the Cold War, and the end of the Cold War meant that uh, people could afford to threaten political stability without external pressure. Um, and there was considerable, at the outset, there was considerable public support for the prosecuting magistrates. Especially when early on in the process, parliament banded together to protect itself from prosecution. Yet after this burst, after this very positive initial uh, uh, effort, Mani Puliti had a terribly sobering trajectory. And we all know the punchline, which is Berlusconi, but the, the path to that was um, a very sad one in which the investigating magistrates lost the confidence of the public, in part because they were seen as politically motivated and overzealous. Uh, some of the prosecutorial instruments that they were using became uh, or were ineffective and allowed defendants to escape. Uh, through the statute of limitations, and this led to a sense of impunity. And so why organize, why mobilize if the prosecutors can't do anything? And then there was actual institutional pu pushback, and Berlusconi's government sought to reduce what they saw, what they alleged were the arbitrary power of magistrates 
There was, I think, also a, a saturation effect. Uh, Vanucci, one of the, the authors who's written most widely about Italy, talks about a saturation effect where there's just daily media bombardment of news of corruption and the public uh, actually, he argues, may actually have, this may have increased public tolerance of corruption because you're just constantly hearing news of bad news. Furthermore, corruption became more sophisticated and um, corrupt politicians, corrupt civil servants, entrepreneurs have learned how to deal with the new tools that were being brought to bear. And then under Berlusconi, you also have a parliament, a legislature moving actively, proactively to weaken accountability. And they did everything possible to make prosecutors' lives more difficult strengthening evidentiary protections, decriminalizing accounting fraud, reintroducing parliamentary immunity that had been lifted, eliminating sentencing rules, reducing statutes of limitation for corruption. And so the end result was that this anti-corruption burst did not yield an equilibrium shift. And if you look at Italy's rankings today, they're more or less equivalent to where they were at the time. Second example, perhaps a little less well known, is Mexico. And you may recall that when Vicente Fox was elected in Mexico in the uh, early 2000s, uh, one of his campaign promises as the guy who was coming in to replace the PRI was exactly this, that he would fight corruption and he would do what was possible to take Mexico to a new place. And what we've seen in Mexico is that this top-down effort from Fox downward petered out. And it petered out for the most prosaic of reasons, which is Fox and his party were accused of corruption themselves. So they lost credibility and these efforts lost credibility. And so today, as we look at Mexico, there's been according to the rankings, very little improvement. And there are huge questions about the independence and the effectiveness of the judiciary. And even well-respected institutions like the Electoral Institute uh, have come under fire in recent years. All right, so bad news, depressing news, slow news. And now we come to what, what can we do if this is the case? And um, what I want to suggest to you is that the literature as it stands today, essentially there are two wings of the anti-corruption literature. The first wing of this literature is so heavily focused on structure. And much of what I've just described to you is uh, kind of the structural view. This view suggests that corruption is deeply structural with roots in culture, roots in inequality, roots in the unrule of law. And so it's really hard to think about prescriptions if this is the case. And generally speaking, authors who work in this field, who I would identify as structuralist, the only way that you get change is through a big bang, a critical juncture, a crisis. And so for example, Rothstein and Uslaner suggest that some of the countries that have made a leap in anti-corruption did so either through occupation, being occupied by a foreign power, or because of an external threat like the Soviet Union, or uh, because of war. And certainly the Swedish case fits there, the Japanese case fits there, the Finnish case, the Korean case. Uh, all of those improvements in those countries were in many ways motivated by these kind of crisis conditions. The problem with this, of course, is that in structural approaches to corruption, anti-corruption gains are often only purely incidental. You know, maybe in response to the crisis, you decide you need a more effective government, so you fight corruption. Or maybe, as in the Korean or the Japanese cases, you decide that the best way uh, to fight the problems the country is facing is to improve the educational system, and it's through that channel that you actually begin to fight corruption. 
The other problem is we can't just create these external sources of change from thin air, and we wouldn't want to if we could, because they are more damaging than the corruption itself. The second body of literature gives us a lot of tactical responses and essentially is offering up what I've called here policy bursts. And so, for example, Transparency International has a very influential handbook that was written by Jeremy Pope at the beginning of the century on what is called national integrity systems. And the central idea of uh, national integrity systems is that you create integrity pillars and these integrity pillars include things like uh, an independent and accountable judiciary, an independent auditor general, an ombudsman's office, uh, an, an anti-corruption agency, and so forth. And this is problematic, obviously, because it's based on the idea that every little bit helps. And so if we just create enough institutions, something's going to stick. Something will make a difference. And the fact of the matter is, that's not the case. What you get is a long laundry list of uh, one-size-fits-all remedies. At best, those are going to help some topical maladies, but there's not much guidance in these systemic approach, policy approaches for how you sequence the reforms, how you implement, or where they fit in the systemic whole. And so you tend to get cookie-cutter solutions to corruption that are implemented without great thoughtfulness for how they're going to play out in the domestic context. So what I want to suggest for us to think about is a more strategic accountability approach. And when I talk about accountability, I'm thinking about accountability both, sorry, both in terms of anti-corruption but also more broadly. And accountability here is essentially the ability to hold political actors to account, to ensure that they have to answer for their actions and that those actions can be monitored. The nice thing about focusing on accountability more broadly than simply anti-corruption is that oftentimes even corrupt actors in a government see some benefit to accountability. So, you know, even a deeply corrupt president might see some benefit to imposing controls on the bureaucracy or to ensuring that the bureaucracy is accounting for how it is responding to executive directives. It also tends to increase the constituency for change, right? Rather than focusing simply on anti-corruption, Let's bring in business. Business sometimes doesn't care terribly about anti-corruption, but is very interested in anything that increases efficiency or efficacy. It may also encourage uh, civil society. Well, my uh, central logic here is that we should be planning these reforms in a strategic fashion, recognizing that these equilibria are dynamic. That is, like institutions, these equilibria have to be continuously re-updated. Every day when you all you know, participate in public institutions, you are reinforcing those institutional dynamics. And to the extent that those institutions can be destabilized by incremental iterative accountability reforms, it may be possible to make quick progress. So, Quickly here, uh, looking at some cases of countries that have done something similar to this, uh, I came up with something which is not, not entirely um, original, but I think systematizes what I'm talking about. And what you see in countries that have made quick gains in the anti-corruption field is that they've implemented something that looks similar to this, where they have implemented reforms across transparency, oversight, and sanction. And then there have been changes in terms of the institutional effectiveness of their uh, governments and the political dominance in the political system. So let me just speak a little bit about each of those briefly. Um, the nice thing about having an equation like this is it gives us 
I hope, a mental map for how we might go about designing um, accountability programs. The, the central idea here I'm, I'm uh, perhaps filching from Danny Roderick's work and the work of economists at the Kennedy School more broadly who have focused on bottlenecks, what they call bottlenecks to economic development. And with the notion being here that rather than trying to fix an entire economy, sometimes it's better to go after what the particular bottleneck is at any given moment at a time. And I'm trying to translate this into the anti-corruption field and thinking a little bit here about how it is that today's bottlenecks, once resolved, lead to future bottlenecks. And so just to give you a Brazilian example for those of you who are from Brazil, you know, when you think about what has happened in Brazil, not since Lava Jato, but, but thinking about Brazil over the past 30 years, we've seen a number of different bottlenecks being tackled over time. And you couldn't possibly address the problems of 2010 without having first addressed the problems of 1990. So, for example, when you have the Escándalo dos Anões in Congress, it leads to changes in budget process. Changes in budget process make possible, for example, the Real Plan by increasing fiscal accountability. Then that enables tracking of funds that, I'm shortening a very long story, is further strengthened with the creation of anti-money laundering laws. Well, at some point, the Ministerio Público, which has been independent for this entire period, the prosecutorial body, actually sees that it has tools that it can use. And so some of its bottlenecks have been removed, and you can see at least portions of the prosecutorial body beginning to function more proactively. Not all, but some. And now that those groups are functioning proactively, they're running into a new roadblock. And I think the roadblock now is judicial inoperancy, the, the judiciary not functioning the way uh, many would like it to function. Anyway, uh, I didn't want to get into Brazil, but I wanted to give you an example, and we can discuss this more, the Brazilian case, a little bit this afternoon. But the point being, I think that if we think about bottlenecks, where are the bottlenecks that we're facing today, and what of removing those bottlenecks, what will that mean in terms of the bottlenecks that we're likely to face tomorrow? So the first component here is transparency, uh, which is, at its, in its essence, public access to meetings, to procedures, to information about what the government is doing. The second component is oversight, meaning that the government's functions are susceptible to ongoing surveillance, meaning that uh, rather than simply having a right to evaluate a government's performance, civil society, prosecutors, other government agencies can um, be embedded within the government and have regular visibility about what the government is doing. The third component, and this is particularly important in the context of corruption and democracy, is sanction. So if you think about the classical literature uh, in public choice, or you think about the classic literature in criminology, and I'm thinking here Beccaria, Bentham, uh, even Becker, the three Bs, Beccaria, Bentham, and Becker, when you think about this literature, it emphasizes costs and benefits. You have to have effective sanction if you're going to deter crime. But in a democracy, sanction has a much more important function. It's not just about deterring crime, it's also about serving a societal role of not just the individual calculus about whether to commit a crime, but rather demonstrating that there is a societal norm at work. We, as a society, care if people are doing X or Y. We, as a society, believe that the norm should be whatever. It also has a function, sanction does, in terms of creating, setting up an iterative process of self-evaluation. Looking at 
what the underlying dynamics were that led to wrongdoing, and then providing clues about how we can better realign institutions and incentives to deter abuse. Now, those three aspects, of course, take place within a broader context. And so I'm using, math, uh, I'm using algebraic notation here. Really, it's, it's soft algebra, please. I'm a political scientist. It's not, um, it, please, these are not uh, algebraic terms. What I mean by the multiplication sign there is simply that this framework of transparency, oversight, and sanction is tempered by, it is um, shaped by institutional effectiveness and political dominance. And institutional effectiveness is a catch-all term, but it's a term which I think has three central components. One is state capacity, a professional bureaucracy with the ability to implement policy free of undue external influence. The institutional toolkit is the second component, the, the laws, the, the mutually supportive bureaucracies, adequate budgets that are needed. And then third, and perhaps most important is citizen engagement. And citizen engagement is a force multiplier. It's a way of making transparency, oversight, and sanction all the more effective. And then you'll see a minus sign there. And all of this is undermined by political dominance. And political dominance, the history shows, I pointed out Singapore. It's one of the few cases where you have political dominance actually leading to improved accountability outcomes. But it's a rarity. And so, generally speaking, political dominance diminishes all incentives for active oversight or sanction. Other things equal, the more dominated agencies are, the less likely they're going to be able to fulfill their accountability function. So, that's the framework. How did I come to it? Well. Partly um, by looking at countries that have changed, that have seen an effective, self-sustaining equilibrium shift. And again here, this doesn't mean that they went from Afghanistan to Denmark. It means that they may have gone from some intermediary place to another one, but it's a new equilibrium, it's a new place. It's a new mental framework for thinking about trust and reciprocity. And what's very interesting is that they did so in relatively short order. So <clears throat> to find examples of such shifts, I went to the world governance indicators and specifically to control of corruption. And those of you who study corruption may know that there's a whole debate about how much you can do longitudinally in comparing these indices. And the nice thing about the World Bank's control of corruption index is that provided you use the same index year, on the same basis all over time, and provided you take into account the margins of error, which are, which are shown here, you can, in fact, compare one year against another. And so what you see here is the, the top three performers in the world over the more or less 20 years that this data has been collected. When you look at the data set of control of corruption, the, the top 20 countries, the countries that are up there with Denmark, are all rich, mostly small, and predominantly European. In the past 20 years, furthermore, only four countries have joined the top 20. And of these, only Japan, which is shown here, only Japan came from outside the top 30. So there's very little movement here. <clears throat> but again here, reaching the top echelon doesn't need to be policymakers' objective. And even shifting from the bottom group to the middle of the pack would be a very significant gain. And so over the 20 year period covered here, only eight countries out of 200, more than 200 in the data set saw a 20% improvement in control of corruption. And I'm gonna somewhat arbitrarily say that a 20% improvement is an equilibrium shift. Okay, you've actually changed things in a permanent way. So 
<clears throat> the top two graphs here show you the two top performers, Georgia and Rwanda. And then I've also included Japan, partly because in addition to this very important move it made into the top 20, it's one of the few large countries, it's got a population of more than 100 million, that's shown statistically significant gains over this period. The other reason that I've chosen these three countries, or, or let me put it a different way, one of the reasons it's nice that these are the three countries <clears throat> that <clears throat> sort of popped up when you look at the data is that despite vastly different histories, very different demographic sizes, and very different levels of wealth, as you can see in the table here, Rwanda has a GDP per capita of less than $700. Japan is closer to $35,000 a year. All, all three of these countries have essentially followed reforms across the full accountability equation that I gave you. And this is a stark, in stark contrast to countries like Italy, which have been too reliant on reforms in a single area. For example, in the Italian case, prosecutors, without a widespread push to improve performance across the broader accountability equation. So let me just show you how this plays out. Um, and I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly. So uh, I know we're running tight on time. But here's the case of Georgia. Georgia, of course, in structural terms, had some good things going for it as it moved from Soviet domination into the post-Cold War period of, um, for lack of a better word, kleptocracy, because it was essentially a kleptocracy. But then it moved into a much cleaner equilibrium by 2010. And so structurally, you might say, well, Georgia is very different from many countries in Latin America because it had an educated population already. Uh, it had enormous potential from eliminating the distortions of Soviet economic policy. And also because the Soviet or the, the post-Soviet collapse removed all of or most of the elites between 1991, when Georgia broke away, and Georgia's Rose Revolution in 2003. And yet, Georgia also did a couple of other things that, according to one observer, yielded a mental revolution. And so here, I've kind of broken down what some of the, the top policy uh, initiatives that they've undertaken into the different fields uh, in this equation. So, um, you know, this sounds a little bit like Sweden in terms of transparency, competitive civil service exams, registries, um, uh, civil registries to make sure that we knew or they knew who, what citizens were doing and, and what kind of benefits they were receiving, automation of public services. One of the most important things in Georgia was actually this last one, competitive university admissions. Why? because there was corruption in university admissions, and this was one of the most important changes because you can imagine what this did to the public mindset. Once you eliminated the corruption that ensured that elites were getting their kids into school, guaranteed while nobody else would, that set up a, a, a move to equality that was uh, very, very significant, is often seen as one of the most important changes. Um, in terms of oversight, there's all sorts of different forms of oversight here. One is by decentralizing to the local level, but associated with that is monitoring local governments much more closely. Uh, also in regards to university testing, putting com cameras in all testing rooms, just so that there was a, an online record of uh, what was happening in those classrooms during the exams. Sanction, I won't run through each one of these, but basically really changing the likelihood of punishment, but also in some very important symbolic ways, including, and this was, I loved reading about this, traffic police. There was a problem with the traffic police. They were known to be widely, widely corrupt, and so uh, they were all removed, all, 16,000. Yeah, there, there are probably some downsides to this. Uh, you can imagine, uh, you know, that we've seen in other countries that they may go out and make trouble, but it nonetheless changed the, the thinking about what the public norm was here. And then associated with this, you had 
a number of efforts to try to make the public sector work better, make it more effective, including at the bottom there in the anti-corruption field. And then I think also importantly, there was political turnover. And the initiator of these corruption, anti-corruption reforms, Saakashvili, was replaced, was replaced um, by the Georgian Dream Coalition. So all of this is uh, very positive news. Now, Georgia is not Denmark, and uh, if anybody who's followed Georgia recently knows that um, the police are still not entirely seen as um, clean-handed. The courts are less independent than they might uh, be. Human rights violations are common. Uh, there is not much prosecution of elite corruption, but there's nonetheless been a move from a very low equilibrium to a middle equilibrium. Rwanda is another example. I won't run through the whole thing, but Rwanda, if I put up a table, it would look very similar to the Georgian table here. Um, and I guess the thing to say about Rwanda is that unfortunately, although it's a democracy, political domination has been constant. And so President Kagame's uh, seeming permanence as a lifelong president uh, is perhaps the greatest impediment to judicial in independence, and that in turn uh, leads some to question the extent to which this equilibrium shift will be embedded. But nonetheless, an important change. And then finally, Japan offers a great example of just how lessening political dominance can uh, contribute to a significant improvement in the performance of the full accountability uh, framework here. After four decades of LDP rule, uh, in the early 1990s, Prime Minister Hosokawa was elected, and he undertook a variety of initiatives to make sure that the existing institutions functioned as they had been designed to function, rather than as they were functioning under the LDP government. Again here, the supreme irony of anti-corruption, Hosokawa, as you may have guessed, was removed after a scandal. But the very notion of turnover changed the way the LDP itself governed and used those institutions. So again here, active competition strengthened the effective enforcement of existing laws. So with that in mind, let me just wrap up with some concluding thoughts. The, the first thing to say is that a lot of countries engage in strategic thinking about anti-corruption. And there are uh, a number of international bodies who also engage in this kind of strategic thinking. Transparency International does what they call national integrity system reviews. The OECD conducts integrity reviews, including recently one of Brazil. Um, the, there are under the UN Convention Against Corruption, there are regular uh, anti-corruption strategies. The Open Government Partnership, which Brazil is a co-leader of, has national action plans. So there's a lot of strategic thinking that's going on. But even in these cases, I think the strategy falls short for a few reasons. The first is there is no continuous reappraisal, not of how the institutions are structured, but of where the bottlenecks to effective accountability lie. And so thinking about accountability across these different spheres, transparency, oversight, and sanction. Secondly, there's very loose coordination of both the reappraisal process and the reform proposal process. Third, the, um, most of these reviews don't embed civil society. There's very uh, little effort to have widespread participation by actors from distinct agencies and from civil society organizations that know best how each of these components works. And then fourth, and this is sort of where I think we can make the most progress, the adoption of new tactics is seldom done in a conscientious and iterative manner. And so what we see is that the marginal effect of policy bursts tends to diminish over time. Progressing from policy bursts to an actual equilibrium shift 
really requires repeated iterative efforts to prevent backsliding or to prevent the kind of institutional drift that I've already described. And then I think just generally speaking, we're doing so little to actually think about where bottlenecks lie uh, and what the causes of those bottlenecks are. What are the particular circumstances that cause those bottlenecks and then is the bottleneck a consequence of policy, of political will, of legislation, is it capacity, where is it arising? So, the approach I'm advocating really is, is trying to uh, suggest that we need both an incremental and an iterative approach, that we need an approach that's broader than anti-corruption and uh, moves to accountability as a whole, but that nonetheless enables us to undertake changes that are not as glacial as they have been in the past. So hopefully that's at least enough for us to begin conversation. Thank you for your attention. So we are opening the floor for questions, remarks. So yeah, I'm Travis Canole from Duke University. Um, I have a question not only about the Brazil case, but uh, also two other cases, the U.S. case and the Chinese case, um, to sort of go to your points about the, neg the possible negative effects of, an, of overzealous corruption campaigns. So uh, an argument has been made here that uh, because the campaigns were so sweeping against in charge, the most charges brought against the against particular political parties, and that parties in in particular other parties in particular regions escaped the 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 corruption charges in here in Brazil. That that has weakened the long term credibility of the judiciary. A similar thing, a similar issue happened in in the U.S. with the Hillary Clinton investigations into the email, uh, into her emails and the and the server, which played a major part in in polling suggests in Trump's election, and then in China, uh, a extremely popular anti and quite effective for a while anti-corruption campaign against one of the factions, the military faction of the Chinese government under former President Jiang Zemin, turned into a consolidation of, of Xi Jinping's uh, power and later the removal of term limits. How do you, uh, how do we make the case for long-term anti-corruption efforts if uh, the results in at least two, no three, if you count Brazil, of, of the world's great powers leads to political consolidation, not necessarily less corruption. So, so oh, you wanna? Would you mind? Is no, yeah, we go one by one. It's if, better. Yeah, I'd like to say Zay's answer yesterday, which is I can only keep one question in mind at a time, um, and that was three. So I'm gonna do better than average. Um, so Travis, I think the the I'll go in reverse order. I think that the issue of China, I, I don't want to talk about, I was charged with talking about democracy, but just quick democracies, um, which I think are a particular subset because we can do things in democracies that we can't do in authoritarian regimes. I also think that in the case of China, this was an anti-corruption drive that was based, partly because it's not a democracy, more on coercion than on compliance. And I think th these are two terms that we should keep in mind. Too often, even in democracies, the focus of anti-corruption is on coercion and coercive sanction, rather than on resurrecting the norm that then becomes complied with passively, right? And, and so I think I'd like, I think, I appreciate you raising China because I think it's really important for us to think about compliance as a term that's unique to democracy. Obviously, there's compliance in China, but it's, co it's coerced compliance. And I, I like to think about compliance as a broader phenomena that's unique to democracies because we embed the norm. We embed the norm in, that's popularly mandated or chosen by representative institutions and thereby um, implemented. So I think that goes a little bit to what I was trying to say about sanctioning and the, the phase of sanction. 
On um, the U.S. and Brazil, so I, I'm, I'm tempted to say we're going to talk about Brazil this afternoon. I won't go far there. Um, I think that there, but I will say, I think there was a phenomenal bit of bad luck in the Brazilian case that's caused by institutional factors, but has also been played by particular actors in a way that takes advantage of those institutional factors. And so what I'm saying there is that there are kind of three ways that you can address corruption in the Brazilian case that we've seen recently. One is um, Lava Jato in the 13th trial court in Paraná, the federal district court in Paraná. That's one. Then there's the STF, and that's where you deal with other politicians. And then there's other first instance courts, and I'm thinking particularly Minas Gerais, right? And so there's three different patterns for behavior in each of those. And I think the piece of bad luck resides in the fact that those three different instances have dealt with corruption in very different ways. Um, so I'm going to stop there because I think I'd rather hear the Brazilians talk about this, um, but I think that um, there is a, a phenomena here which is both institutional, actor, and political. Now, um, the broader issue that you raise, and I, I'm happy to talk about the US, but the broader issue which you've raised about the politicization of corruption, I think helps to explain why equilibrium shifts take as long as they do historically because there actually has to be turnover, and, and maybe the turnover is not just electoral turnover, but also turnover in the targets of investigations before the norm is embedded fully, right? So um, I, I fully take your point that politicization is a problem and oftentimes undermines anti-corruption efforts. I'm not sure, um, though that if you had smoothly functioning and efficient institutions, politicization would be as bad. So I'll leave it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, first, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm Douglas Block from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so my question is, is with this talk, everything you're looking at is a top-down approach, and we're assuming that bureaucrats and government officials are just corrupt and hosing the system because they can. Um, but as you mentioned, like the, the police, if you have corrupt police, that means you have someone who's paying the bribe. Um, and I don't work with corruption, but even some of my own field work here in Brazil, talking with deputies, you s see some of them saying, look, I have people coming to my office demanding that they, I pay their light bill, or they're going to make sure no one votes for me. They're going to tell all their friends to vote against me. So what is the role of changing society's view of corruption of hey, I'll take this parking ticket, or I'm driving drunk, so I need to take the consequences as opposed to paying a bribe. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I take your central point, which is that civil society engagement is essential. And I, I kind of threw that into the category of institutional effectiveness because I, I deeply believe that the institutions don't function without that kind of constant feedback. Uh, and just because I like anecdotes, I'll give you an, uh, an anecdote from Brazil, which I think is illustrative of a number of different things, including my cowardice. Um, and so the anecdote is when I, when I first moved to Brazil, I started dating a woman who is Brazilian, and she later became my wife. She still is my wife. Uh. <laughs> um, and I was in the car driving with her back from the beach with her brother, my brother-in-law now, and we got pulled over by the highway police. And this was the 1990s, and things were different. I think things have gotten better. And um, the cop pulled us over, and you know there was a conversation about uma cervejinha, um cafezinho, something like that. And um, being the gringo, I was like, just pay the thing. Let's get out of here. Just pay. We're out of here. Just do it. Like, let's not pick a fight. And my brother-in-law said, no way I'm paying you. I'm not paying you. And the policeman said, well, then you'll have to come inside. He said, well, I'll come inside. So we went inside. I'm thinking, just pay the damn thing, right? <laughs> like, um, and so I, um, you know, the anecdote goes to your point. I think that 
there, there has to be that kind of pushback. And I've heard numerous anecdotes over the years of people, one of my favorites was another friend uh, here who, he got pulled over by the cop, the cop said, your fire extinguisher is out of date and the, you'll have to buy me a cafezinho. And the guy said, well, I'll bet you, if it works, I don't buy a cafezinho. If it doesn't work, I'll leave. And pulls it out, sprays it, cop looks really sad, but they got to go on, right? And I, I, I think, that's a wonderful thing, and I think that to the extent that citizens do that, institutions function better. But it really is determined, it's not a cultural thing. I'm not a believer in culture. I think that culture is, you know, a sack of cats. It's a, it's a mess uh, as an analytical variable. But uh, nonetheless, we can say something about how people, what the norm is that people think they should be following and the extent to which they're willing to stand up for that norm. Next. Hi, thanks a lot for the fantastic presentation. You show us a very nice model about how to fight corruption with three different analytical space. But when you show some data, you show just the case where the things work, where something ha uh -huh. have, gone, have achieved a nice result. Have you tested it for uh, experience of fighting corruption that didn't have any effect at all? Right, so, you know, I, I, I didn't present it in the same way, but the two cases that I, I talked about as failures, Italy and Mexico, are, are very clear cases of precisely failure across the board. So in the Italian case, as I mentioned, uh, the emphasis of the entire effort was I think isolated in two different spaces. One was sanction through prosecutors, and the other was institutional effectiveness through new laws. But there was very little done in the other spaces. So, to my knowledge, there were no transparency reforms. Um, in terms of oversight, there wasn't great improvement in oversight. There was some change in sanction, but not, not meaningful enough. And so it was a very isolated effort. And if we were to think about sort of where that effort was placed institution-wise, it was heavily concentrated in the prosecutorial service and nowhere else. Um, in the Mexican case, and actually that takes me back to a point that I think it was Travis made about top-down. You know, I think, oh, was that you in the back? Okay, sorry. But, um, you know, I think the central failure of the Mexican case was it, it was essentially a top-down effort. And I didn't mean in any way to suggest that this should be a top-down effort. I think it needs to come from both directions, and partly because of the experience of Mexico, where um, you know, they said, let's implement a bunch of these national integrity pillars, like ombudsman, uh, you know, anti-corruption agency, and so forth. But because it was top-down, all of the norms of the civil service in Mexico infiltrated the institutions as they were being created. So there was no effort to bring in external forces uh, to, to engage in those agencies to make them truly independent and so forth. So y your question is a good one. I'd like to look more at failures, but those are two failures that I think are very illustrative of why you need to go broader than just focusing on sanction, for example. Um. Matthew, thank you very much. I'm Jose Shigub from the great nation of Texas. Um, <laughs> so I find what you're doing very interesting and I find it very heroic that, um, um, that you decide to take on this, this, this challenge of explaining uh, you know, uh, successes and um, failures of corruption. So I don't really have a question, but I just want to ask you for your reaction to thinking about Corruption as as too broad an outcome, because it encompasses all sorts of behaviors that um, we have to to you know. It, I wonder if it wouldn't be more productive for us to try to understand um, um, dimensions or aspects of corruption. So when you put the United States as a success case um, with Italy as a failure. You know, so I keep thinking, like, you know, if Italy is a failure, but it's the seventh economy in the world, um, you know, not a big country, so what's the counterfactual there, right? What would have been, what would Italy be if Italy were a success story, if there were no corruption? 
or when we think of the United States and we think of machine politics and local politics, and so, you know, Chicago is still a very controlled, um, anti, non-competitive um, um, political system. But if we think of the United States as a whole, or if we think of the U.S. during the Progressive Era, you know, being doing all those things, but supported, you know, in a, in a situation in which you know, at least a third of the country was living under a one-party regime at the local level, um, you know, very authoritarian. So I guess my question, I mean, it's not a question, but I just want to hear your reaction of, to the idea that maybe you should parse out the, the, the dependent variable and start to think in terms of, I don't know, electoral corruption or corruption for contracts with the government or, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, uh, that was uh, uh, not a question, but it was brilliant. So how's that? Uh, no, and I, I would answer by saying I don't think of this framework merely in country terms. And I've chosen countries here because it was the easiest, most easily available unit of analysis. I also chose it, I'll admit openly here, what I wouldn't admit to the reviewers, which is... Um, with Brazil as my shadow case. And Brazil is very much in the back of my mind, partly because of something that Brazil has that I think is very useful. And in some ways, follow, uh, I follow what Brazil is doing here, which is ENCLA, the national anti-corruption and uh, anti-money laundering, anti-corruption strategy, which is unique among most anti-corruption strategies in being a yearly exercise where the interested parties are sitting down and actually talking about what's working and what isn't working in different spheres. So, you know, the short answer to you is um, Brazil being a national case and that shadow kind of being in the back of my mind drove choosing the national case. But I do think that the, this framework could be applied in a company. It could be applied in an NGO. It could be applied to a single agency or to a single city. And I, I agree with you, you know, I think that the same move that's happened, for example, in the study of democracy from the national to the subnational uh, should be happening here as well. But also, you know, within democracy, we never break down democracy as a concept, but within corruption, we have the liberty to do so by looking at low corruption, procurement corruption, you know, grand corruption. So we, we can do that, but I think that the same framework would be helpful even when we're doing that. So it, just, you know, to arbitrarily pick procurement, pro procurement reform in New Orleans in the 1990s. Could you do it? You could do it with this framework, and I think that that might be a helpful way of approaching it. But, I, but I, your point is a great one. Hi, uh, Alexandre from the University of Belgrade. I would like to ask you regarding Rwanda, because Rwanda has a specific role uh, regarding the factor of being in a country that has a gender gap, that's the six. You have all the, Nord uh, the Nordic countries, and you have Ireland and Rwanda. So what do you think about the role of women in, in com uh, combating corruption, since it is a country due to the, uh, to the genocide? Uh, I don't know exactly the rank, but Rwanda is, re is really high regarding the representation of women in parliament. And what is the connection with this and corruption? Also, because if we, we look to Yunus uh, and Gramin Bank, is also based on gender. So how do you see gender and corruption and how this can help also the combat of corruption? That's, that's a great, uh, great question, and I'm, I have never done work on this, but the work that's been done in the field uh, suggests that women are typically much less corrupt than men, uh, both as recipients of corruption and as givers of corruption. Um, so yet another mark against men. Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, uh, Rwanda has a number, you know, the genocide changed the mindset in, in Rwanda, and, and you know, to some extent, it makes me wonder if I should offer it as a case, because success in, in fighting corruption was partly possible because there's such a strong consensus about the need for political engagement, for conciliation, you know, it, it, all of a number of things that have to do with the peace process that then influence you know, the norm about taking bribes and giving bribes and so forth. Um, 
And yet, you know, Rwanda is seen very much as a unique case on the African continent. And so I appreciate your raising gender. It, wasn't, it isn't a part of my analysis, but uh, it's well worth bringing that in. I would see it as an intervening factor, though, as you think about the structural change engendered by genocide, gender, and then corruption. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Elia from Federal University of Pernambuco. And my question is regarding your formula there. Yeah. What is the, um, the reference of period that I should look at? Because you brought us examples of success analyzing a 40-year period or 60-year period or 10-year period. But when you said on failures on Italy and Mexico, mm -hmm. you analyze only a decade. And, and you said, oh, you should be a little bit optimist of Brazil if you look over the last 30 years. So what is the specific time period that I should look at uh, when I want to see whether there was an improvement on corruption, corruption fight? If, if each case you, you analyze a different period. Thank you. It's a, it's a wonderful question, partly because uh, it gives me something to go back and change. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I should probably think about that more carefully. I, th I think, um, I guess my central point is it is possible for us to engage in short term, meaning in, within a decade, uh, reforms that could add up to something big in a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And you're right that there's a little bit of a dissonance in my analysis of the different country cases, <clears throat> for example, in Italy to say, 1992, they did something, they had a spurt, and then today they're back to where they were. Um, but I, I think that's partly because this paper is both political science and policy advocacy, and that's always a problem. We have to be careful of that. Um, and so from a political science perspective, I think we really shouldn't be thinking in shorter than a couple of decades. Uh, but from a policy perspective, I think we can be sh thinking in a shorter time frame, but informed by the longer term uh, changes that we've seen historically. And um, I would still stick to Italy as a case, though, because I think we can today, uh, here we are 30 years on, say, no, it was a failure. And um, I take Zay's point, maybe if we look at you know, improvements in Florence are, have been better than they were in Palermo, fine. But, but I think at a national level, um, we can uh, analytically, with no normative judgment, uh, look at the case and decide that really, no, it, it, it has been a failure. I think uh, in the Brazilian case, it's far too early to say, but I, I also think it's useful. People tend to think, or people where I live, um, tend to think about what's happened in Brazil only through the lens of Lava Jato. And I, I just think that that is too short-sighted because there were many changes that happened before Lava Jato and that will continue even when Lava Jato has either succeeded beyond belief or been totally discredited that make it hard to go back to the status quo in 1985. So, that was a non-answer, but I, I think that's partly because uh, you've pointed to an important problem. That we, we, you know, there are different time frames depending on what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Anyone else? I have a small, oh, no, go ahead, here. Well, while they get you the mic, I, I have one uh, question that maybe is related to the question that is, what about measurement? Yeah. How does this index are constructed? W what goes on in there is much, I guess, uh, is always, they are always constructed with um, perception. No. This one is what? Well, uh, no, and, it's many and, times they are, but not and always. And I, yeah. I, I would uh, consider, you know, what is in there? And um, going to the Jose Shebubi's uh, observation that we would probably have a better way to assess these things if we were to break them into cases or pieces. For instance, 
I would love to see where Switzerland enters this yeah, yeah. index. So everything happens there in their bank system. And they are said to be clean. So why? I don't understand. So, and for quite a while, now that had changed, right? Because of some stuff, but, so, there is something that we measure as being corruption, and there are the things that we don't consider corruption, but uh, what is, so, I think that, well, I guess this is what I wanted to uh, bring to your consideration. So um, being on stage with Fernando and having him ask you a small question is always uh, painful. <laughs> he knows exactly where to go and hurt you. Um, uh, but uh, no, I think you, you, you put your, na your finger on, you know, a central problem with all corruption work is the measurement. And um, there are a couple things that I would say in response to, to what you said. I don't disagree with the fundamental uh, basis of your question, um, which is that many measures of corruption are perceptions based. I would say that even those, though, can give us a sense of whether there's been an equilibrium shift. So just to give mm -hmm. you the example, the classic exa example, and I don't like defending the Transparency International's uh, Corruption Perceptions Index because it's flawed for precisely the reason that you just expressed. It's just perceptions. But Rwanda, in the period that I analyzed here went from something like 90 in this ranking to something closer to 50. And um, you have to be very careful about comparing perceptions, but the fact of the matter is it's very unlikely that 40 other countries moved and that Rwanda somehow moved up. Uh, you know, I, I think that their perceptions are capturing something, but I take your point. Uh, partly in response to this, I think, uh, you know, it's interesting to use other measures. I talked about Glazer and Golden's work on the United States where they look at media reports. Um, uh, Kate Bursch and Sergio Prasa and I have done similar work in Brazil where we look at media reports on individual government agencies. So we're, we're looking at reports of, scan of corruption within a particular federal agency. And so we, ha we can get a measure that's agency level and I think that that's much better. It's still media, and we know there's an accusation in Brazil, an allegation, frequent allegation, that the media is biased, but we don't think that the media is always going to be more biased against the transport ministry than it is against, I don't know, social development. Um, you know. So I think that there are uh, other ways to get at corruption that are important. One of the best ones that's being used now is actually looking at global financial flows. So global financial integrity uh, has a measure which has its flaws too, but that looks at uh, the holes in the balance of payment that are unexplained and tell you a little bit about the comparative holes in a given country's balance sheet. Uh, where you would expect to see them. And, and so, for example, Brazil does middlingly well. Uh, Mexico does very poorly, uh, which we would expect in a country that has much higher organized crime, much higher drug trafficking, much higher corruption. So uh, on the point of Switzerland, you know, I fully agree. I think that, that this is a whole other issue. Uh, where the measurement that's often used for cross-national analysis isn't getting at a particular form of corruption. TI has responded by putting together a global bribe payers index, but even that doesn't quite get to the Swiss case. And I think my favorite statement about all, of all time about financial flows is some, uh, I think it's Nicholas Shaxson wrote that the two biggest uh, money laundering spots in the world are islands. Mm -hmm. Can you guess which islands? London and New York, right? It's not the Cayman Islands, it's those two. And so I think, you know, this is, um, you're absolutely right, there's a problem on both, both ends of the, the spectrum here, so. Okay. Yeah, thank uh, yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan Phillips, and I'll soon be joining Aduspi as well, so um, thanks to Matthew for the presentation, and I think this follows Fernando's question. Um, my big question is really, where's the economy in your, your framework here? 
Um, because ultimately, of course, corruption is really about you know, the flow of value through, through the political and the economic system. Um, so at a conceptual level, it would just be great to really understand where that comes in. Um, but I think my concern is really that, that this political dominance variable that you're, you're sort of using, I wonder if that's the right sort of analytical level to, at least in an explanatory sense, help to understand when we, when we have these successful anti-corruption movements. It seems that a lot of the work is, I mean, you have the example of Rwanda, for example, which is, you know, glaring, but there are many others where political dominance is not really what's moving here. At least from, from what I can see moving is the relationship between the political elite and the economy, right? So in the Rwandan case, it's very much about the relationship of the military and the, the, the political elite having control of business groups, which sort of bring that corruption with inside the regime and sort of almost legalize the corruption by accumulating rents within the system. Mm. And so that permits them to sort of reduce corruption perceptions and day-to-day -day corruption while still maintaining economic control. Yeah. In the US case, there's really interesting work. Um, DDQO at Stanford University has sort of sought to explain these changes in the late 19th century by looking at the, the pressure that came from growing diversified economic business groups on political actors, right? So that diversification of the economy that drove the change. So it would be really great to hear more about that. Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't want to add one more to the kitchen sink of <laughs> variables that are that are there but I, I take your point I think at some level at the beginning of the presentation I showed you know how the economy writ large matters but I take your point that um, diversity within the economy may have a role uh, there's a very good uh, piece by um, uh, his name is escaping right now. oh Michael Johnston at Colgate who has written about syndromes of corruption and he basically argues that, you know, the U.S. case is very different from the Mexican case, is very different from the North Korean case, but they, each of them is representative of a particular syndrome. He has four syndromes that he thinks encompass all of the cases in the world, and those syndromes are largely determined by the economic, the interaction that you've described between the economy and politics. Um, and so, I liked the way you phrased the Rwandan case. It sounded very much like what he calls interest group corruption in the United States or in France, for example, where basically elites no longer have to corrupt because the system already embeds a fair amount of influence peddling through lobbying and, you know. And then there's, I think, a debate that's happening in most wealthy economies that in indeed may explain the populist movements that we've seen uh, precisely over what is the correct degree to which we should permit this influence. And so, you know, Trump's famous phrase about the swamp. Um, and, um, you know, I think that there's no easy answer to those issues. I guess on the ladder of abstraction, though, I'm trying to deal with a problem that's lower down and maybe is unable to deal with you know, it's, it's able to deal with particular instances of wrongdoing rather than the systemic uh, norm around how we expect influence to be curried. But it's a great, great, great question. Anyone else? We have time. No, we don't. We do. We have time. We have 10 minutes. Or you're going to... Or I'll talk at you. Yeah. You want to talk something else? <laughs> you want to sing? I might sing. Yeah. Well, so if no one is... You want to make a question? Oh, okay. So, thanks, Ma Thank Matthew. For this...